There we are. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Captain Brandon White here with my guest and uh, continued guest here, which I'm enjoying. Mark from King's Landing Sport Fishing over on the Canadian side there. I'm um, coming to you from the south shore of Lake Ontario. We're going to be talking about brown trout fishing tonight. Um, as we're introducing everyone here, I'll give you guys a little bit of some clips from last year. You can watch us fight some brown trout here live. A lot of the tactics that we're using in these um, in these videos here are ones that uh, that have worked for us. And I'm going to be talking about a lot of this stuff here, a lot of the stuff you're seeing in the video. You could hear me talking there. Uh, you're hearing me basically discuss a lot of the stuff that we are uh, discussing tonight. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to get, get right into it here. Uh, make sure you like and share the video. If you haven't, we're going to do an extra giveaway tonight. Uh, Rochester Sport Fishing is going to throw in a uh, piece of apparel uh, along with the torpedo product for the Q&A winner tonight. So make sure you share this video. Make sure you tune in till the end. Uh, win yourself some extra extra goodies tonight. Uh, so we'll get this started. Mark, tell us about uh, your brown trout setups and some of your go-tos. I'm excited to learn about some of the stuff that I haven't used before. Yeah, I'd say uh, it's interesting. Uh, when you asked me about the, this one and the topic, uh, at first I went, oh my gosh, reason being is the last few years I've not actually done much brown trout fishing because uh, for me uh, on the North Shore of, uh, of Lake Ontario, I you know, call it Toronto, um, our marinas actually for the most part don't open until May 1st. And, uh, and with COVID, things have been so screwed up that it was closer to the end of May or early June that the boats were in the water and operating. But that being said, prior to that, um, you know, I would often, uh, most years take my boat across the lake at the end of the season and I would leave my boat. Uh, I'd store it actually at, uh, um, Port, uh, at Weller Bay. So, uh, you know, by, uh, by St. Catharines and, uh, you know, do some brown trout fishing over on the South shore in the, in the spring, you know, it was a great, uh, it's, it's a great fishery because, uh, and you know, you and I were talking, you never, you never quite know what you're going to get, um. And it's, I, I like it. Like I'm a, I'm a simple brown trout fisherman. So that's what I would say. Um, I like it. You know, you're fishing typically the, you know, shallow water, really close to shore. Um, and it allows me to kind of get the, get things all figured out uh, before, for me, the main event starts, which is obviously the king fishing. But, you know, like I said, I, I, I do it simply. So for me, uh, my, my go-tos are, um, I personally like to still run a lot of spoons when I brown trout fish. So I'll run a lot of smaller a lot of smaller spoons, you know, stuff like stuff like this, you know, small small stingrays. Uh, uh, let me bring you, uh, let me bring you hot, uh, big there. So sounds good. Yeah, no, I, I run a lot of smaller spoons. Like I said, like a spoon. This is a real simple spoon. It's just a, a chartreuse and you know white spoon. You know, I got some of the small stingrays. I'll I'll use a lot of you know. I got another one here. You know, green. For me, it's very much you know if I'm a uh, if I'm fishing the you know the dirty water for browns. I'm using bright colors, you know, your sartreuses, your greens, um, you know, I'll, I'll put some glow out there, you know, I'll have some of my, uh, my ones behind me, but in the smaller standard size in the, uh, we know green dots, black dots, et cetera, you know, and then if it's, if it's clearer water, that's when I typically go to a lot more natural, uh, natural colors. But like I said, I, I, I fish for browns simple. So uh, typically when I'm fishing for brown trouts, at brown trout, it's, it's planar boards, so I'll use uh, usually it's my inline boards. So I like the Dreamweaver Ninjas. I'll use the Dreamweaver Ninja boards. Um, typically, either I'll take my downrigger rod and I'll just uh, the, the ones I use in the summer with you know thirty or forty pound mono, and I'll tie on a ten pound section of uh, of um, fluorocarbon, and you know fish those with the spoons on either close to the surface. If I want to get it down a little deeper, I might, uh, I'll use the, uh, the torpedo. This one, I think the, if I look at, it, I think it's the snapper. It's their two ounce. I'll use like a torpedo snapper on a, on a, a drop clip. This is just the yellow version of an OR 16 with a pen. I'll, I'll use these. Um, I'll use, a, a, you know, sometimes I use a one or a two color, uh, lead core, or, you know, what I like to do is I like to use the, uh, weighted steel, like a 25 foot section or even a 50 foot section, get me down five or 10 feet below, a, below the water. You know, often, you know, I'll, you know, if I'm buying like a, a 400 weighted steel and I only want to put a 350 on the reel, I keep those, I keep those segments because they're great for setting up for, uh, setting up for Browns. 
So, but like I said, for me, it's quite simple. Um, I do believe that, you know, the, you know, some people argue uh, this flack, but I do believe sp Browns are a bit spookier. So I personally like to have my baits when I'm brown trout fishing away from the boat. That's why I go to the, I go to the, the planer boards most time, either with, uh, either with just, you know, straight spoons or with a one or a two color or a small segment of way to steal. Yeah. The other thing I, sir, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, I was going to say, and to your point earlier, we were talking earlier that, um, well, to the, the positive of the South Shore, which uh, kind of why Mark gets right into the uh, king fishing, is that the that um, the South Shore has a great stocking program, and a lot of those browns are native. They come back to those same areas, and uh, they don't – not to say they can't wander off, but they definitely don't wander as much as the kings do, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you're watching the video here where I had a, a video where we were just on them good and give everybody something to look at. And uh, this is kind of reminiscing of, of our one of our great first outings. This is, as you can see up there in the top right-hand corner, this is March 19th, 2020. So that's coming up quick here. And um, before you probably see me and Mark again or one of us individually, this date is already going to have came and passed. So we want to make sure that we're giving everybody some, uh, some tips and some pointers. And... Uh, you're seeing a lot of the baits that I'm that I'm using in, in these videos here are just constantly doubled and tripled up. This is what you want. Um, but one of the things that uh, pro and con, depending on what type of fisherman you are, if you are like Mark or you're like Kip, my business partner, who has a large boat, you are somewhat stuck to the port that you are at. So based on what you're given in terms of watercolor, you need to make adjustments. If you're in that um, that smaller uh, more recreational type boat, you have that option to go from port to port to port and, you know, choose the type of water and the color water that you want. And that's kind of what Mark was getting at here, uh, I believe, with uh, talking about a little bit more stealthier program based on, you know, what he's given. Uh, so if he's given a more uh, clean water scenario, they are definitely going to be spooky. You're going to have to fish for these fish. Uh, two completely different ways. And I feel like anybody that's out there that says, oh, what are your top five brown baits? Well, I guess it depends on yeah. what color water I'm fishing and what time of the year it is, you know. Um, in the spring, you don't have that big push of bait fish holding tight to shore. You're more focusing on gobies and anything else that's in there. So you're, you're fitting that bait profile um, clean, you know, and you're, you're either going to have gin clear water, or you're going to have colored water um, and you need to, you know, change it up differently. Um just to remind everybody, if you haven't already liked and shared the video, go ahead if you uh, haven't. We appreciate it. Jeff Richards is the winner of the Spin the Wheel contest. You get into that Spin the Wheel contest by liking and sharing this video. You'll be entered for next week. Uh, Rich Ganino is also a winner. They will be, both be getting some great prizes. I see uh, Rich is uh, getting the deep collection. That is a great win. Out of all the prizes that you could win, uh, the entire torpedo weighted deep collection. That's awesome. That's like a seven dollar value and prize. Uh, if anybody didn't hear, um, Rochester Sport Fishing here is giving out a, a free apparel as well for the Q and A winner. So make sure you stick to the end. Uh, if you're just joining us now, Mark was going over some of the things that he does for spring brown trout fishing on the North Shore and how he fishes for them. Um, a little bit more of a downsize tactic with. Um, more of a, a spooky style of brown uh, that he's going after. So I'll, I'll let you take back over, Mark, and uh, you can show us some of the things I'm really interested to hear yep. about your your slide diver rigs. And I would say just one one piece to clarify there, uh, there, Brandon, is um, I, I don't actually brown fish on the North Shore. I, oh. actually go, to the, I go to the South Shore, <laughs> the Canadian side of the South, south Shore. Uh, you know, I, I can't say that there aren't browns on the North Shore, just our marinas aren't open. Like we, you know, even the marina I, I work out of, uh, it's May 1st when my lease starts and you can't get in earlier. So the, the biggest challenge we have is, uh, is actually marina space. So um, most time when I brown trout fish, it's on the South shore. Like I said, those years where I brought my boat across in the, in the fall and stored it on the South shore in Niagara Falls, St. Catharines area, or if I'm out fishing with a, with a buddy on, on their boat. But yeah, like I said, a couple, I, I, I do, I do uh, come from the school that, you know, I think brown trout are a little more spooky. So I, I downsize my lines, 
you know, I run, I run lighter tests. Typically I think the max test I'll run is 12 pound when I'm fishing for Browns, maybe 15, but you know, I'm running and I'm running fluorocarbon, but you know, for me, I one, one thing I'd like to do is, and I think most people know me when I'm salmon fishing, I'm a slide diver guy mm -hmm. and I translate that into Brown trout fishing. So this is one of my slide diver rigs. I just got it spooled up on an, on an old <laughs> way to steal um, spool here. But basically I think this is 12 or 15 pound fluorocarbon. And then I got a slide diver. And I'll have, I think this one setup's got about 40 or 50 feet of fluorocarbon. And I'll basically tie this on to um, my braid diver rod. And, uh, you know, you don't need to, you don't need to let much out. Like I was looking at a, I was actually, I can, this is one of those ones I can never, I can never remember the, the dive charts. I actually have it on my phone here. And, you know, if I want to get down like, you know, 10 feet below the water, I let out like 25 feet with this, with this slide diver. And I'm down about I'm a, I'm down about ten feet, so you know that way I can actually still have it away from the boat, but I can have you know so I've got it away from the boat that you know call it twenty five feet obviously is on an angle, but then if I let out another 40, 50 feet of that of that fluorocarbon, you know that's definitely again away from the boat. But one of the ways I use a smaller slide diver, you can you can use a standard slide diver. The challenge is um, you're going to have barely any barely any line out, yeah. which means that it's close to the boat. And that's why I, I truly love these uh, these mini slide divers here. I got a, I got a whole bunch of them. The other thing I, I do, and it's kind of again back to, you know, the, the spooky presentation. Of, you know, I like to run planer boards, but if if I've already got you know two or three planer boards out from each side, and I still want to put more more lines out, I'll use my rear planer. And this is the this is a rear planer cone that I clip on to you know whether it be a you know, just a, a one, uh, you know, one or two color or 25 or 50 weighted steel, or maybe even just, you know, I've, that, that line that I've clipped on the snapper. And then I will basically clip this on because I don't like having, like, I don't like having rods. i uh, sorry. I don't like having gear at the back of my boat. And what this does, it allows me to send it, you know, 50, a hundred, 150 feet away from the boat. Cause I like to keep the back of the boat free a, because I personally feel that the, the Browns are a little bit of a spookier fish. But B, when you when you do get a fish, I don't want a commotion at the back of the boat in the tangle. You know, the more time you tangle, the more time you you're not fishing. So that's just something I do. Plus, with a bigger boat, like you mentioned, I got a I got a 27 Tierra. The boat's probably 10,000 pounds. You know, I got I got a great little because Suzuki high output 99 kicker repropped it. It works great, but it still makes a lot of commotion. So I I personally don't feel that's helpful when it comes to Browns. Yeah, totally agree with that. And um and like you were saying about the commotion in the boat, doesn't matter what species it is, is, if it's the spring and there's cold water from where they hit to where they are now, they have still have plenty of energy when they're yeah. in the back of the boat. So the last thing you need is a tangle there. And, um, you know, that just escalates when you turn into kings. Um, you know, the browns are spunky as well. Um, yeah. and, you know, they, can, they can cause plenty of tangles as well. Uh, to kind of go off what Mark was saying, um, same concept, you know, um, the one thing that's awesome about, about brown trout fishing is your more recreational type of fisherman doesn't, you don't need downriggers to fish no. for browns. Um, you don't need dipsies to fish for browns. You know, you could realistically go out there and just run two or three planer boards on each side or a flat line and, and you're still going to catch fish. You can enjoy that fishery in the spring there. Um, but when we are running dipsies and, and trying to kind of uh, give ourselves more room at the back of the boat, uh, what we do here, and you, uh, a lot of people have heard me mention it before, um, we use these Chinook divers here. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the smallest version with me. This is a size two, uh, talking about, let me get this, this uh, light away from here, here as you can see it. Uh, but actually, we have a size one, uh, which is about half the size of this, uh, super small. And what we do is... Um, what I, I started to implement, I uh, took a tip from another captain, is actually run mono. And so, you know, when we first started using dipsies uh, in shell or six years ago, using the size two, because that was the smallest one. And I kid you not, we'd have our dipsy rod with the wire on it set at seven, <laughs> seven. Yeah. That's what it was set at. Um, you know, and then we progressed into the size one Chinook divers came out, uh, which were smaller. So then we were about to get about, approximately about to get 25 feet of line out. Um, to stay under 10 feet. Uh, but then I got, a, we got a tip from another captain that uh, suggests using mono. So once you add that mono setup in there, uh, depending on, you know, the situations, you can even get even a little bit farther away. Um, and it actually helps you out with two other things too. Number one, if you 
uh, get real shallow or you're not paying attention, that thing bangs into the bottom, you're less likely to use it if you lose it if you have mono on there because you have that stretch with that wire. Obviously, you have none. It can snap it right off. Uh, number two, uh, me and Mark were talking before everybody was signed on here, and we've in, – in the spring, in uh, late March and April, we've caught anything from – Kings, Browns, Lakers, Steelhead, Smallmouth Bass, Walleye, Northern Pike, the list goes on. You don't know what you're going to get. So if you, we've uh, literally had Kings hit with seven feet out. And if that thing is not set properly in terms of tension, he's going to blow the whole thing up and you're not going to yeah. see him again. Uh, so having that mono gives you a little bit of stretch in there too with that shorter span of line and, um, uh, that much spring happening all at once. But, but that's the cool thing about brown fishing, right? Like you do not, you, you on like my view is you don't need to have special gear for brown fishing. Like you can, yep. you can take your downrigger rod from the summer, throw on a small diver or a small Chinook diver, whatever you have. And you can use that mono rod um, as a diver rod when it's coming for browns, when you're only fishing, you know, five, 10 feet below the surface, you know, you can, you can be a bass fisherman and have a bunch of your rods with the, uh, with uh, bait casters on that you use for bass fishing, and you can you can chuck some spoons or some crankbaits and those on a plane aboard, and you're good to go. Um, you know, even I, I have a I have a, a customer of mine that also has his own boat, and he's like, hey, should I should I put rig together some some short short weighted steel or short core rods for the spring? I said, hell no. I said like, why are you gonna go spend money on a rod, money on reels for for to set up some a couple of combos that you might use for one or two weeks of the year, maybe three weeks of the year? I said. Just take take your downrigger rods or your braid diver or your braid uh, diver rods from that you use in the summer. I go tie a one or two color on or a twenty five or a fifty weighted steel. Like it, it's it's super easy and and pretty. You can make your other gear pretty versatile versus spending a fortune on, oh, on just can, fishing totally for browns. When we were young, we used to use our spinning rods and we put yeah. them in the rod holders and we just troll with our spinning rods and you know it was a it was a blast. It wasn't we didn't catch you know. The 20 40 fish uh, uh a time we are catching now but you know just a handful of fish uh we were we were uh happy with we'll answer a couple questions here uh let's see if i do the yep there you go um so steve asked do we run snubbers off the chinook divers or browns no i don't when it i actually don't use snubbers at all i don't know about I don't know about you mark um but i i set my drag no matter what time of the year it is i set my drag the lightest that it can go where it's not taking out line um, based on yeah, I don't, the speed and the current. Yeah, I, I don't use snubbers when I'm uh, using these mini divers. I, you know, but I, it is it is fluorocarbon, so there is very there is very little stretch, but it's about setting drag properly. And when I'm uh, when I'm fishing for kings in the summer, I've actually again I'm a slide guy, slide diver guy, but I've converted my setup so I, I run wire divers, but I've actually I tie a 30, 40 foot section of uh, 40 pound mono, so that gives me my stretch. Uh, versus mm -hmm. having snubbers I, i've been doing that now for about uh, actually last year was the first year i tried it and i like it much better than running snubbers so i don't use snubbers anymore perfect yeah and and for me yeah just uh don't don't see the like you said don't see the need if you have your drag set properly i think that's the no. huge thing when, if you're ever on my boat i'm literally all if there's nothing going on i'm checking drags i'll go through and just check every single drag and every single single rod uh yep. next question here Let's see. Uh, so Rick said, what's the difference on how you're rigging your rods when you're seeking for browns early season? Uh, so for me, um, I'm running either, uh, uh, if you're just tuning in, you missed before, I'll kind of do a little recap of, of what Mark shared and I'll go over a couple things too. Uh, if I'm using hard baits, uh, I have a little, little pad here I'll show everybody um, and I'll just keep it real simple. If I'm using hard baits, I'm using just a mono setup and I got my Yozuris here. I know my camera's not the best on my laptop, um, but some of my go-tos, let's see over here, uh, Yozuri uh, Red Holographic. Uh, this, you can't, this color isn't great, uh, but this is a Puerto Rican here. Maybe that color's a little bit better there. Uh, orange with black dots. Uh, let's see, we got the Fire Tiger Yozuri. These are all three and a half inch. And if I'm going slightly deeper, uh, I'm using something like this. Uh, this is a three and a half inch deep diver, the Ozuri. Uh, those I'm running on all mono lines, anywhere from 100 to 125 feet out. 
uh, if I'm using my riggers, my dipsies, um, or one color, two color, 25 feet of uh, weighted steel. Um, some of my go-tos are, let's see here, I got my um, lances two, you know, if I'm looking, depends if I'm looking natural uh, for clear water or uh, bright for dirty water, mixed veggie, salmon candy, dirty white boy, uh, frog in both silver and a gold cup. And then, you know, what I'll do too is uh, kind of as Mark talked, I'll kind of downsize a little bit. So here's a couple right here. Um, we got the, uh, let's see, there we go. The Flutter series by Warrior. So these are actually even smaller than their XL series, which I was just showing here, which are their consistency with a super slim. So you can see the, I'll put them right next to each other. The size difference there um, of the two. There you go. Um, so they're definitely, they're, they're thinner, uh, they're less wide, uh, and they're a little bit, little bit shorter. Um, I like the, the XL series as they're mixed between a standard and a flutter. They also have the flutters, which are even lighter. Um, and then also obviously we mentioned the, the super slims there. Uh, if it's dirty water, I'm using brights or glows. If it's clear waters, I'm using naturals, um, and, you know, you mix it up a little bit, too. Um, a lot of it depends on that, the color of the water, uh, as we kind of mentioned before. There are no guaranteed go-tos when it comes to um, brown trout fishing because you don't know what the color of the water should be. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I'm uh, some different spoons, but similar. Like, I use a lot of standard size spoons. This one's super simple. It's just a glow with green – glow with chartreuse dots, you know, glow with green dots. You know, I've got I've got another one black. It's black and you. It's got a UV and glow with black dots, glow with black dots. And I've actually got a couple of repaints. Um, these are actually they were uh, they were the small stingers, but you know, like a, a green jeans, a black jeans. Um, just you know, I, I keep the spoons pretty uh, pretty simple. It's funny, you know, um, spoon manufacturers might not like me for saying this, but you know, uh, I probably downsized my spoon box now to maybe 15, 20 spoons max in my box. And those wow. are the spoons that I can use. I use all year long. Now, don't get me wrong. I got about 10 of each of those spoons in my box. Yeah. But they're, they're, they're my go-tos. Like, I, yeah. I used to have, you know, I've got special mates here. I used to have, like, five or six special mates full of different color spoons. But then you kind of sit back and you ask yourself, you know, how many of those spoons do you run? 90% of them never come out of the box. Yeah. So, oh, it's 100% 100 yeah. true. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's actually funny you say that uh, – I wish I knew the name of the podcast, but there's a Lake Michigan podcast. I think it's called maybe Real to Real Outdoors or, or something like that. And it was funny. They were that was one of the questions on there. They talked about was um, when do you change and how long do you give it, etc. That was the basis of the question. And their answer was, "I'm going to go with my go tos. I'm going to change to some of my backups." And they were like, "Odds are, before I go to my number threes, I'm going to go back to my go back yeah. to my go tos." And that's just the way it is. And, and I, I think you're completely right. And that's why I think, uh, you know, sometimes in the videos I'll promote so much to go by, you know, the terminal tackle and get your, your gear set up. Right. Um, and, and worry less about less about your spoon collection. Cause odds are you're going to have so many that you won't even touch some of them from beginning to end of the year. Yeah. It's funny. We just got a question. We just got a question come in at you right now, Brandon, about scent. And uh, someone just said, do we use Atlas Mike scent when we're brown trout fishing? Bingo. That's what I use. These are the, I use the herring and the owl wife when I'm brown trout fishing. I, I use the same too when I'm salmon fishing. Like this, this is the scent I use all the time. What, um, for people that aren't familiar with it, uh, what's the consistency and how do you apply it? I just put, I just put a little dot on the back mm -hmm. and then I'll just, uh, usually just take my finger and kind of wipe it around and that's it. Like I don't put, I don't put a lot on at all. Um, I just do make sure that, uh, when I'm done at the end of the day, I wash that spoon off and wipe it with a microfiber towel because this, the scent does mess up your spoons and you'll find over time, your, the back of the spoons kind of tarnish. So then I'll also, you know, at the end of the season, give them a good wash and actually, you know, some people might laugh. I'll actually then I'll, I'll clean and polish the spoons. Like you can actually just put a little bit of like canuba wax and you can bring those spoons right back up to brand new. Almost. I do that at the end of the end of the season. How often do you reapply? My descent, uh, typically after each fish. 
There you go. Hey, you can, why not, right? Yeah. yeah if, if anybody follows the uh, the Roman Axe with Fishing 411, they're huge on scents. And one of their yeah. things is to clean them is they suggest cleaning them as well with lemon lemon scent joy. Yeah. Um, that from the dollar store, they said this is a bag. I got Hopefully, lemon. I got lemon dawn, which I would use. There you go. Perfect. There's something about that that helps yeah. helps clean it from what they've said. Uh, so, do you do S turns in the shallow? Of course, yeah. S turns are a go to slowing down half the spread, speeding up half the spread. Um, you know, the really thing that you got to watch out for and just pay attention is is watch your speed and watch your depth because there's a lot of rocks, boulders, and whatever in there. So if you slow up too much on the one side you're going to bury all your baits and you just need to be careful of that. I think um, Browns are notorious for being right on the bottom when they're deeper, but I don't think you need to focus on being as close to them in shallow water. I honestly think if you're getting down, you know, two to five feet, that that's plenty. I don't think that you need to, to try to be within inches of the bottom. Like you may have to do in the dead of summer when you're trying to catch a monster Brown, you know, they might not want to move, you know, more than a few inches off the bottom. Um, but when you're talking these spring hungry fish, um, you know, don't feel like you need to get right in the bottom, especially don't lose a downer your ball. Uh, you do not need to. The video that we were showing earlier, if anybody's watching, um, we, we actually mentioned how deep, uh, the riggers were set at, and they were set at five and six. Um, and I believe we were in, you know, approximately eight to 10 foot of water, you know, so we're multiple feet off the bottom. Don't feel like you need to get there. And, uh, it is not worth losing a downrigger ball over that. I'd much rather lose a, a spoon on a mono rod or a crankbait on a mono rod than a downrigger ball. <laughs> so if I'm going to get close to the bottom, it's not going to be with my downrigger. At least you, uh, on, on that point, though, uh, Brandon, I got a question for you. Do you use your downriggers much when you're uh, brown trout fishing? Yeah, so um, like you were saying, that the uh, the stocking program and the quantity of browns that we have, we just have a ton of browns. And – so when I say uh, say stuff like having Dipsy set at seven feet out and they're hitting and uh, downriggers, you know, typically we're running them a little farther back in the spring, maybe like 50 feet back. But we're also using smaller spoons. You know, we're not using a, a large spoon that has a lot of weight to it. You were using um, another one we use, too, is the um, the Stinger Scorpion, which is a super small one. If anybody's not seen those, those are super tiny. Um, I wish I had more of them on me, but they're actually in my boat right now and i don't don't have them with me my boat's not at my house um but so you're able to get farther back with those super small spoons but i do not suggest doing that if you're using a larger a larger spoon because you are going to have some weight and that second you slow down that thing's gonna yeah gonna bury right in the bottom so you know a lot of it is just knowing how your your bait's running knowing how your uh your boat handles and like you said you know you're running you know when I'm running my smaller boat and I can get out in March, um, you know, I'm only running a 19 foot lunge. So I have a little bit more versatility, you know, as Mark was talking, you know, he's got to, he's got to pay attention well above because he's running a 10,000 pound boat. Um, so, you know, he's got to plan his, his movements way yeah. earlier than I do. Um, you know, so a lot of that has to be taken into consideration too. Uh, So um, yeah, I'll kind of knock out both of these questions here. I don't, I don't know. Let me see if it'll let me show two questions at once. No, it won't. All right. So the two questions, um, one was the deepest feet of water um, and how shallow. So uh, spring, you were looking, if you can find uh, pea green water, that's the best. You really don't want mud. Uh, stay away from mud if you can. And if you don't have an option, go to where the mud is mixing with the clean water and, and look for stained the biggest thing you have to try to understand in the 3D aspect when it comes to mud is you don't know how deep it goes. Is it the first six inches? Is it the first foot from the surface? Or is it the whole water column? And then it's really hard to tell, you know, what what you need to be using, how far down. There's so many variables, in my opinion. So try to go over that mixing. Green for based on your port. Um, that's when we're going to the naturals, reducing your line to, you know, uh, 10, 12, 15 pound, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, trust me, you can catch browns and big browns on 10 pound uh, tests as long as you're fighting them properly and drag set uh, properly. I mean, I've caught kings on on 10 and 12 pound line, so it can be done as long as you're drag set properly. Um, and then the other thing is temperature. If you can find the warmest temperature, they'll be there. If it is clear, you just need to be a little bit 
more stealthy with your tactics. Um, but typically I'm going as I'm having my, I'm, if I'm starting my day off, my inside big board is uh, 30 feet from shore. As long as there's no other boats. Um, my inside big board is super close to, uh, close to shore. And I think those, those flat lines far away from the boat are going to catch me the majority of the Browns. Um, I don't know anything you have uh, to talk on that. No, I, I agree. Like, I, I think uh, that's the one piece, like, don't be afraid to go close to shore. Like I've had, I've had time moments, but not, not in this boat because this, this boat I think is too big for that. But when we used to have the, our 19 foot Sylvan, you know, I felt like I could practically touch the, uh, touch the shoreline. And, you know, then we'd have a planer board running really close to the shoreline and, you know, pulling out, pulling out Browns. That is also the time I was joking around you where I, I caught a bass also because yeah. they were right by the shore. But um, yeah, I don't, Personally, I don't, when I fish for Browns, I'm usually inside of 20 feet, probably more so 10, 15 feet of water myself. I don't fish for them deep. Yeah. And I think, uh, and I could be totally wrong in this, maybe just my opinion. Um, well, this kind of goes to a question up here. I don't want to miss it uh, while I'm looking for it here. If you haven't already liked and shared, make sure you do um, get entered into the spin the wheel for next week's contest. Uh, so, oh, right here it is. Question about the prop rod. I honestly, I think that there is a, and I could be totally wrong, but just from what I've noticed is that I think um, stocked fish versus natural born reproductive fish, I think they're, they, they mentally feed differently, if you want my opinion. And the reason I say that is because when they release the stocked uh, browns in the summer, they have been waiting until they get a little bit bigger recently, closer to that maybe like 8 to 10 inch range um, to, to help with the, the cormorants and stuff going after them them when they're fingerlings. And you'll get we'll get them on mag spoons. We'll be fishing for king salmon or monster brown trout uh, in the you know middle or late summer, and they're hitting mag spoons. So that tells me that they're not scared, but what it also tells me is I'm like, I know it's a stocky because they just released it and they're super hungry. So going back to this question on the board about prop wash, honestly, I think it depends on the fish. I think, you know, I think if they're hungry enough and the water's dark enough, they'll come right up to your boat um, and, and whack, whack that bait. And, and so will Kings, you know, but I definitely have noticed the stockies are not scared of anything. Um, yeah. It's funny. It's funny you say that. So when I read this one, it, it took me back. I li- I think some people know I used to live out in British Columbia, just outside of Vancouver. And I had the luxury there of being able to fish the ocean, but also there was a whole bunch of uh, freshwater small lakes in and around where I lived, and uh, they were actually stocked with uh, with a kokanee, kokanee, which is like a land, it's a landlocked salmon. Um, and uh, my gosh, like I would literally fish for those, and you know have the have the baits like ten foot behind the boat, and they would they would smash them all the time. So I'm with you. I I totally agree. I think they're I used to. I didn't quite put it the same way you did. I was like, I think stocked fish are stupid and just will bite. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we'll try to nail out a couple of these other questions. And then I got a couple more tips I can give you and then we'll wrap it up for the night. Uh, Charlie asked about side scan. Um, I honestly don't use side scan. I I just, I don't have enough time to pay attention to my graph, to be honest with you, Um, to be able to put that into um, terms. I just honestly go on my knowledge of uh, what I'm looking at water wise. And for the most part, you know, like we talked about, you're kind of stuck to your ports. You do, yeah, you can run a little bit, but um, you know, you're you're kind of taking what you what you've got. Um, you know, once you even if I do have a a wreck boat and I can pick a port, but once I launch my boat, I'm not taking it up and moving it. Um, you know, so you kind of have to go with what with what you're given and and run with it and make changes and and see what's working. Um, but no, I I don't I don't use the side scan when it comes to at least any honestly any lake ontario fishing and the, and the other piece with side scan right like let's call a spade a spade many of us like i think about my boat it's being completely rigged for salmon so like for trans boost transducers i got like a p66 in the back for redundancy i've yeah. got a b60 in the in, in through hull i've got a chirp through hull i don't even have a side scan so it's actually it's a great question because this you know i'm i've got all raymarine right now and i'm actually slowly putting some garmin on the boat so I've, i'm putting second system and with my Garmin setup, I'm actually I'm gonna have side scan, and I'm gonna and I've also added the pen optics. So like this year, I won't be brown fishing because I'm doing a, I'm I'm doing my uh, epoxy barrier on the boat uh, this year, so it won't be won't be till end of May and before the boat goes in the water because of the temperature. 
But I can't wait to actually get to the South Shore and brown trout fish with that setup to see what the side scan is showing me. You know, even with the pen optics, you know, I've got my pen optics flipped. But with that, I can actually change the – I can still change the transducer angle. And, mm -hmm. and I actually look forward to doing that, to seeing, you know, if I, if I start firing the, trans, the, the pen optics – against the shore what do i see so I, I think a lot of us that fish browns our boats are set up for um they're set up for salmon where you don't really use to your point you're not using the side scan i bet you get some guys out there fully rigged with their bass boats i bet you, I, if they were fishing for browns they'd probably be able to tell us stuff that we didn't know yeah for sure yeah and we on our large boat we do have uh pan optics and to be honest with you there's you it's you know typically we're running just we don't we don't typically don't run a mate and you're doing, you're just so busy. You sometimes, you know, you, you can see that um, you can see that mark, you know, on, on your history of your graph, but sitting there and watching it, you know, um, obviously there's history with side scan too, but I don't feel like it's as long. Um, you kind of have to look for the fish in the shadows a little bit more, um, but we have pan optics and unless we're fishing a tournament um, and we have somebody like kind of keeping an eye out for boats and stuff like that to take a peek at it. We honestly don't even have time to look at it. Um, you know, we have it, but it, it's just, it's so hard to use it. Um, Wade's got a big question here. You change your speed to adjust certain variables, controlling speed that you always try to keep the boat at. So we'll, me and Mark are going to be talking about that. He likes to go a little bit slower, 1.6 to 1.8, I believe, right? Yeah, 1.6, 1.8, especially when it's cold water, cold and clear. Yeah, and, when it, yeah, and I'll mix it up a little bit. Um, same thing, I'll go on the on the – if it's clearer water, um, I'll go a little bit slower. Uh, try to be a little less less spooky. Um, if it's dirtier water, and there's a potential for other species to be in there, um, I'm running at my normal speed of anywhere from two to to two five. But I definitely run sl just slightly sm slower for browns, especially yep. uh, in the spring. The other thing I would say too, like when I fish for browns, you know, I've learned not to use my fish hawk. I don't even put it in the water now. Because mm -hmm. you're fishing in such shallow water, there really, for the most part, there isn't much current where, at least where I'm fishing, mm -hmm. I don't see the point of putting the fish hawk down. And, and to your point, snagging a downrigger against a rock, a downrigger ball, ball against a rock, and then losing a probe. So, like, I, you know, I find GPS speeds just fine when I'm fishing for browns yeah. in 10, 15 feet of water. So, guys, don't, don't, don't sacrifice your probe or put it at risk, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, John, real quick, uh, this sent that. Sent that Mark used was called Atlas. Atlas Mike's Lunker, a wife and Heron. Great stuff. They also make a they also make an anchovy and a sardine, and those ones work well too. Yeah. Um. So let's see. Uh, so let's let's do a part of this this first part of this question. What's the strangest uh, contents for you, Mark. I don't, I haven't really seen anything out of the ordinary perch, gobies, you know, various bait fish, but nothing, any, anything too crazy inside of a trout. Some people, some people might hate what I'm going to say, but I have never killed a brown trout out of Lake Ontario. So I wouldn't be able to answer the next question. I, 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 I released them all. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, don't, I typically don't, you know, clients keep them, but I, I typically yeah. don't. don't when I, when them. I brown trout fish, typically it's not charters for me. It's, it's early. It's early season where it's either me and my dad or me and my buddies or I'm with another buddy. And, uh, you know, I don't I don't keep many fish myself. Um, mm. I usually keep fish that, you know, I can't release and they just die. And uh, with the browns, usually I find we can – it's cooler water. They come in pretty quickly. They, they all live. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, so we don't want to go too much longer here. I'm going to do a couple quick more tips, uh, and then we're going to get into uh, the question – for the evening, we'll knock out these last couple questions as well that are on here. All right, so um, a couple things. I know some, not everybody has the option to have a ton of rods, kind of what we were talking about. So I'm gonna go over a couple different options here to use what you have to your benefit. Um, and there is a, a question on here that was actually just happened to come up with what I was gonna talk about, ball bearing swivel. A couple different things to talk about, and I know Mark does one of these. Um, so here, um, you can see you got a tiny little ball bearing swivel there. Um, so we use these on everything. Uh, Torpedo makes them now, you, you know, use a size that's appropriate for you. Um, I use these on all my rigs and it's for retying purposes. I, no matter if it's a three or a 400 weighted steel, I'm tying one of those swivels on each end so that I can retie my leader without reducing the length of it. 
and then retie my backer just to retie it. Uh, when it comes to shallow water, same thing. Um, I use use that um, to, um, you know, put, if I need to reduce the size of my leader, um, that's a perfect opportunity without with just a quick quick change. Yep. Right there, even my slide diver, it's small enough, it goes right through the eyelets of that rod. Yep, and then um, I know also that Mark Mark does part of this, and I'll, and I'll mention it. So number one, you can reduce the size of your snap swivels. I use uh, the size one. They're still 40-pound test. You can easily land kings on these things. Um, if you want to get super stealthy, even after the size one, you could use the size one snaps, which is yeah. just – the clip without the ball bearing on it and then have the ball bearing higher up and i actually know that mark does it i he has a video on getting more action out of your lures yeah um, and that's right what there. he does is he's just used a little clip with the ball bearing ahead of it i've watched a lot of mark's videos even before uh we were doing torpedo together um if you have a mono rod um you know mono is great and if you are not running a deep diver and you want to um run a uh, spoon off of it, but get it down. Just get a little um, the lead core. Is it yeah, lead core or rubber core? Rubber core. That's the word. Okay. Rubber core sinkers. Get them in various sizes. You don't need a lot of weight just to get it below the surface. And then going back to those ball bearing swivels again. Or ball yeah, ball bearing swivels there. Um, what you can do is get a one color, put one on each side of um, the one color, and then reuse it. Uh, so yep. when it's early season brown trout, have a mono rod, tie it on real quick for that season. And if you're not somebody that has the option to have a ton of rods, um, just take it off. Just just cut cut the backer and, and cut the leader off and just save that one color and never reduce the length of the one color. Um, yeah, let, let's call what call it what it is. Everyone has a tangle and, you know, they, they tangle their 10 color or their 8 color. Yeah. You know, you never throw that away. You salvage, even if you salvage a bunch of one colors. You can use that in the spring. I don't throw any of that yeah. stuff away. And and honestly, then you could throw it back on in yep. the, the fall for staging kings. Um, you know, you could use a one color, two color for a secret weapon rig too. Uh, so never throw throw your stuff away. A bunch of different opportunities to use those. Um, uh, real quick, we're gonna, just going to try to wrap it up here. Uh, gold does work great, especially um, in shallow water and clear water. It's way more natural looking, um, and I think a lot of people look past that. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to let you answer this question first, Mark, and then I'm going to answer it. Um, I know you haven't done a big, a lot of brown trout fishing, but part two of this question, uh, what's the biggest brown trout, uh, that you've ever caught or had caught on your boat? So I, like I said, it's my, myself personally, this current boat, I don't think I've ever caught a uh, brown in this current boat because I haven't been out oh, in the spring, but yeah. I, it'd be my other, it'd be my other boat, my, my, uh, my smaller aluminum. It was probably about 10, 12 pounds. It wasn't huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I don't do. I honestly don't do a lot of brown trout fishing. For me, I by the time I get out, typically it's. I, I've never got out in March. Typically, for me, when I brown trout fish, it's early April, mm -hmm. and then it's a week or two, and then the kings are there, and then who who cares about the browns at that point? The kings exactly. are arriving. Yeah, so we we do a lot of late sea or late summer brown trout. We love brown trout fishing, but we also have the we also have the stocking program, and we have the structure um in, in our port for them. So you know, a lot of people base base what the, you know, they take what they're given. Um, so that's actually going to be my Q and a, uh, the question answer for, uh, tonight is going to be, uh, what is Rochester sport fishing's largest Brown trout caught to date? So while we're, do, I should play the, the sound here of, uh, people that are, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, on the jeopardy there, like do, 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 as we wait for the, Wait for the answers to come in here, but I'm gonna play some more videos for you guys as we wait for those to come in. Uh, let's see, make sure I get that. Uh, there we go. Um, so we're still learning how to use this new system here. Um, so you guys can watch some action here of us catching browns last. It wasn't that one though, because that one was tiny. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that is the. I don't know. I just as well. There's the holographic redhead catching that fish right there. Um, so that video is uh, is ending right there. Uh, let me, I'll get another one started here. Uh, the question again is, we'll kind of go back to here. I'll, I could actually probably even type it in here, can I? Um, what is the exact pound and ounce of the largest uh, brown ever caught on Rochester sport fishing? That is going to be our Q&A. 
So we need a pound and an ounce. You're not going to get it with just a pound guess. Pound and an ounce. We will. Uh, I'll get some more some more brown action going here uh, while we're waiting. We'll we'll turn the volume off. And we will bring this up here. Let's see. We're kind of we're we're liking this new this new technology that we're able to use here. Um, still still uh, waiting for a uh, waiting for you know some uh, answers to come up here. If I see the right one, I will let you know. Funny as we're waiting, Brandon. That you know, you you talk about. I know I made the comment around. I don't do a lot of brown fishing because the kings arrive. You know, I was talking with a couple of people recently that fish out of my port. And we're all saying we probably drive over all summer long browns and other species just because we're going to the king grounds, right? Like we never really, we never really try for them. So that's the that's the big challenge. I think we're so spoiled with such a great king fishery that we uh, we skip out on the browns, even though they can be a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm going to help narrow down the answer here because I see some answers all over the place and I figured that might happen, but I didn't want to give it away right away because there are some people that saw us win the yellow sea last year uh, with this fish. Um, so what I'm going to tell you it's, it's uh, less than 20 pounds. I'll, I'll put that up there um, as we're watching these videos here. And yeah, we can answer a couple more questions, talk about a couple more things as these, as these roll in here. Um, Brandon, there was a question that came in earlier that was kind of a neat one. It was asking if we've ever ran an an, ever run anchovies for browns in the spring. I love fishing anchovies, and I have never done that before. Like whoever it was, just gave me gave me an idea. Have you ever done that? Fished anchovies for browns? No, and, and I honestly, I I thought that, that was another question that had to do with uh, um, a question that had to do with scent. I, I didn't actually think actual anchovies, but no, uh, I've never no. actually used bait. For, uh, I've, got, I've got boxes of anchovy heads here. Like I love, I love running anchovies, but I've never done that. So I have to give it a go. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, honestly, yeah, I'm not sure. Because um, they're a small, smaller, skinnier bait, and obviously they're very natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, yeah, we might have to wait for it to go on here. Um, I see a bunch of the comments are rolling in quick here, so. I'm trying to keep up, but I don't see the answer yet. I see a lot of people mentioning our previous, previous big brown, but uh, I don't, don't see, uh, don't see the answer yet. Our previous big, I'll, I'll help narrow it down. Uh, there you can even there, there we go. We talked about some stomach contents. There was a little bit right there. I'll rewind that video uh, as we're talking. Our previous was nine, was 19 pounds five ounces previous, but we did beat that this year. So hopefully that. It narrows down the uh, narrows down it there. So here's another another brown caught. Uh, see if I give a uh, there it is. Yeah, look at the size of that bait. That's got to be a four four or five inch uh, minnow there. Um, that these things are spitting up and then they're still hitting more. You know, they, these things are if you can find them, they are super hungry uh, in the spring. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll wrap it up here as these answers are still coming in. I know that we're a little bit ahead um, of the answers. Eventually, it will uh, somebody will get it, and uh, they're going to win multiple prizes. So again, if you haven't, we appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't liked and shared the video, make sure you do. Um, thanks, Mark, for joining me and, and talking about um, talking about Browns, which I know uh, it isn't isn't something you do as often as us. But I know uh, in the future here, you're going to have some have some things that I'm jealous of uh, because of your fishery as well. You know uh, what, man? And now, now I just know like when, when, uh, when the borders all open up and it gets easier to travel back and forth, I'm going to have to come visit you in March to go brown fishing. Yeah, for sure. And you know, we, uh, it is, it's, it's crazy, you know, having, you know, just getting on them. They, when they are schooled up, they are super schooled up and um, it's, uh, it's fun. It's just nonstop. I actually did see the right answer come in. Uh, oh, nice. let's see, there it is. Uh, Tony has the first, I saw the right answer coming twice. Tony has the right answer. 19 pounds, 15 ounces. Uh, and that is a LOC weighed, uh, documented fish. Uh, that's not just saying we thought that we caught one this big. Uh, so 19 pounds, 15 ounces. And that's by the time it got to the scale. So, you know, you imagine how much that fish weighed 
you know, when it was, when it was caught, um, you know, typically those, if you've had a fish on them there, the majority of the day in the cooler, they lose about almost a pound. I've noticed, especially on those bigger fish doesn't, doesn't matter the species, but, um, but yeah, awesome. Congratulations to the winner. We'll get a hold of you. You're going to win some torpedo products and also Rochester sport fishing apparel. If you haven't liked and shared this video, make sure you do. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, Oh, and, and Ariane oh. just told us, oh, Tony <laughs> got it first, but he already won once this month. So Yeah, right? Larry's the winner. All right, we'll, have to, we'll figure something out uh, there. So, yeah, thanks for everybody for tuning in. Uh, again, we'll be here next, not us, but Torpedo will be here next Thursday at 8 o'clock. Tune in. We have all this new software we're using. I think having this, the opportunities to bring in videos and pictures, um, multiple um, other users is, is cool. Uh, so, again, thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and uh, God bless. See you later, folks.